Well, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for today. As we turn now to the ministry of the word, would you please go before us and speak by your spirit. Lord, we pray life, that life would be ministered in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, for two or three Sundays now, I've been trying to bring this message. So here we are. And um, as I mentioned two or three weeks ago, there are five things that we can do, actually do, to help us grow in our spiritual life. One is to, to attend church. All of you are doing that this morning. Good for you. The second thing we can do is get involved in church, not just attend, but begin to build relationships. Where can I serve? Get, get involved in the life of the church. A church is not to be like a stage production. A church is a place where the Greek word is koinonia, but it means participation, working together, living together. So second thing is get involved in church. Third thing is to establish, and only you can do this, your own personal DQT, daily quiet time with the Lord. It's a time where you put your cell phone somewhere else, make sure the TV's off. It's good if you can even get into a place where you're by yourself. Read some in the Bible and pray and develop that part of your relationship with the Lord. That's the third thing. Fourth thing, obey God. Just very simple. Jesus said, go and make disciples, teaching them to follow my guidelines. No. He said, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. So the the way we grow in our spiritual life is we obey what God has told us in this book. And if he speaks something to our heart and we know that it's him, we obey that. The fifth thing we can do is honor God. God in the stewardship of our finances. You may say, well, no, wait a minute. I understand. Come to church, get involved, pray, read your Bible, obey the Lord. But finances, like that's that's my area, right? Here's church. And then here's here's my area. Well, no, that's not true. Jesus said where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I was thinking about this, um, sort of philosophical. Is money a commodity or a concept? Now just think about that someday. Not maybe right now, keep listening to me, please. But is money a commodity or a concept? Well, it's a commodity. I've got a bunch of it in my pocket. You okay? But how about where you keep most of your money? Somewhere in a computer bank, and it's a one or a zero. One or a zero. Is money a commodity or a concept? So. Money is um, a way that we show our priorities. It shows our purpose, what we're living for. Money is how we extend our will into this world we live in. For example, would I rather have, uh, let's say for lunch today, would I rather have Italian or would I rather have um, Mexican? Okay. Well, by money, I'm going to extend my will, my choices, what I what I want to do in life. And that's just one example, but it goes far beyond that. If I spend money here, I can't spend it here because the money's gone. So it's how we make choices and priorities. So yes, indeed, money uh, is something that God cares. Not that God doesn't need a dime from us. Can you imagine God calling a committee meeting in heaven and saying, angels, guys, we've got to work on that. We don't have money this month for the light bill. And, you know, there's a lot of light up here. No, God doesn't need our money. He speaks things into creation. He spoke the world into creation, the universe into creation. What God is concerned about is our heart. So today, as we come to this, and and again, if you're a visitor or new here, I do not preach often on finances. I probably should preach more. But I want to approach it from the stewardship standpoint Um, because we are stewards of everything that God gives us. We want to find out what the Bible teaches. I I want to see us applying biblical principles so that we don't become hobbled or crippled 
by poor finances, for, by poor financial decisions. I, I, I want to see us released in freedom financially. And then number three, I want us to be able to be, as the New Testament talks about, gen, well, and the Old Testament too, generous in, in, in giving, recognizing that money as we're stewards of it is, is to be invested ultimately in eternal things. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> there's one way we could um, bring this to a quick conclusion, and it's a little bit of a joke, but it's like the IRS. So, did you hear about the, the new tax form the IRS has put together? It's the revised 1040. Okay. There's only uh, two, two lines. One, how much money did you make and earn last year? Second line, send it all in. <laughs> um, so but we're not going to do that with the Bible because it's not like that. OK, so we did start a couple weeks ago uh, looking in the Old Testament first and tithing. And we looked at the two examples of tithing in the Old Testament that came before Moses, came before the giving of the Ten Commandments, before the law, if you will. And one of those examples was with um, Abraham. I'm not going to repeat that sermon. And the other was with his grandson, Jacob. And so both of those men uh, had a, a, an incident in their lives where they, they tithed. Was it the only time they tithed? We don't know. It's the only time that was recorded. Okay. So today we're going to look at the Old Testament foundation uh, for biblical stewardship, and that is tithing. Um, but it, I, I want to jump ahead a little bit. You say, well, okay, this is good. I'll listen. But we don't live in the Old Testament. We live in the New Testament. And I think I, as far as I know, we're not Jews. We're, we're Gentiles. Um, Jody and I had a couple who were with us near the beginning of our church. And I remember that uh, we sat either in our living room or their living room. And, and they were wonderful people, wonderful people. He said, well, I, I, I don't believe that New Testament Christians have to tithe. It's not taught in the New Testament. That's part of the Old Testament. And then he went on to say, here, you need to hear his heart. He said, but probably if we just gave like the New Testament says, we'd be doing way more than tithing because we were to be so liberal. And I didn't enter into some sort of a, an argument with him or anything. I just thought, well, that's your perspective. And uh, it is important, very important, that, that love prevail. And I'm not laying out here a, a, some legalistic thing, but I, I do want us to understand what, the Bible and the Old Testament is part of the Bible teaches about tithing because, well, there's, there, uh, there, there really are three main reasons. And I'll give you kind of the crux of the message here. Number one, tithing is an excellent way to demonstrate tangibly that you are putting God first in your life. Amen. It's, just, it's just a wonderful way. I mean, when you, when you think, oh, can I take 10% of my paycheck and and give this to the Lord, give it to church. When you do that, it is an excellent way of saying, I will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto me. Number two, tithing is a great way to support the work of the ministry. And that's basically Fourscore's position, and we're a Fourscore church. It's a great way to support the work of the ministry. Here's the third reason I strongly, personally, and as your pastor, believe in tithing. I do believe it will release God's blessing in your life. I, I do believe that. This is not a pay-to-get scheme. I'm not trying to be some televangelist up here and say, send in your money and you're going to be blessed by, you send in 10 bucks, you'll be blessed with 100. May the Lord have mercy on them. But, and it's not my place to judge their hearts. At any rate, we need, we, we've got to take the whole Bible into, into consideration. And yes, God has attached a blessing to tithing. But it was the Apostle Paul himself who said, I have learned the secret of living with little or with much. And I would imagine that Paul, if anyone in the New Testament, and he wasn't even a Gentile, he was a Jew, that he would tithe, and yet there were seasons in his life 
where he went through times of financial meagerness. So I'm just going to say any preacher who guarantees you, if you send your offerings or your tithes to this ministry, you're going to never have another financial worry in your life, probably you need to find someone else to listen to. But having said that, yes, there is a blessing that God has promised and attached to tithing. Now, in the New Testament, blessings are, first of all, of a spiritual nature. But they also include material things as well. So let's just see what the Old Testament teaches, okay? Let's turn first. Oh, yeah, well, okay, we'll do that. Let's turn first to the... Old Testament book of Leviticus. Leviticus. How many of you would say, Leviticus is my favorite book in the Bible? Yeah, I don't see those hands. <laughs> but it's all God's word, all of it. <clears throat> okay, Leviticus 27, last chapter in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus being the third book in the Old Testament. And when I say book, the Bible is a book, but it is a book comprised of 66 Individual books. How many in the Old Testament? 39. Okay, remember that number, 39. How many books in the New Testament? 27. Nine times three, three nine, 27. See how it's easy to remember that? 39, 27. Okay. Um, Leviticus 27, verses 30 to 33. Now, uh, the, the book of Leviticus was uh, recording a time when the people of Israel were camped at Mount Sinai. Okay? So they're about three months out of Egypt. We're talking here former slaves. An entire nation of former slaves. They're about three months out of Egypt. They've seen the parting of the Red Sea. They've seen the destruction of probably the strongest military army on the planet in the day. And they watch them be drowned. So then they make their way to Mount Sinai. God gives the Ten Commandments. And then the Lord, while Moses was on the mountain, gave him a whole lot of commandments that were not in the Ten. And so we read some of those here in verse 30. Thus, all the tithe of the land... Of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. Well, that's an interesting concept. It is holy to the Lord. So really the correct Old Testament concept of tithing was not, hey, I'm going to take 10% of my money and give it to the Lord. The Lord's basically saying, go to Deuteronomy 8. Any money you got, you've got. Any produce from the ground, from the flocks, the livestock, I provided that. So it, it comes from the Lord, and God says, and the first 10% is mine. That's, that's what he's saying here. Okay. It is the Lord's, it is holy to the Lord. Verse 31. If therefore a man wishes to redeem part of his tithe, he shall add to it one-fifth of it. We'll come back to that in a minute. For every tenth part of herd or flock, whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He is not to be concerned whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. Or if he does exchange it, then both it and its substitute shall become holy. Not a very good exchange from that. Anyway, uh, if, if you, it shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the sons of Israel at Mount Sinai. Um, what he's saying here is if it grows out of the ground... If it comes off of a fruit tree, a tenth of that, and later we'll see annually, so they tithed annually, a tenth of that belongs to the Lord. Also in your livestock, you have them pass under the rod, and every tenth one, you count them, you count that one belongs to the Lord. Whether it's your, your best steer, or it's kind of a sickly one, every tenth one of those goes to the Lord. Now apparently... You could not redeem one of the livestock. Or if you did, and I don't know why anybody would do this, both the one you're redeeming and, and, and the one you have given its place, they both belong to the Lord. So I don't understand why a person would do that. But back with the produce from the field or from the trees, 
let's say, uh, let's say you had wheat and barley. And you, here's your tithe for barley. And you think, well, I, I've got, I don't need that much barley, but I do need more wheat or whatever. You can redeem this tithe by adding another 20% to it. That's what it means when it says one-fifth. You see that there in verse um, uh, 31. So you're already giving 10%. You add 20%. So for 30% of money, you can redeem that barley if you need more barley. I, I guess that's what's being driven at there. Um, but nevertheless, we see that the tithe is a tenth, and it, it belongs to the Lord. Okay. Let's go now to Numbers, which is the next book, chapter 18. Wow. <clears throat> we need a clock that doesn't move so fast. Okay. 18 um, and verse 21. To the sons of Levi, behold, I have given all the tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service, which they perform the service of the tent of meeting. Okay. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had how many sons? Twelve sons. Okay. One of those sons was named Levi. We get to Mount Sinai. God says, I'm going to take the tribe of Levi, and they're going to be the, the ministering tribe. And out of the tribe of Levi, I'm going to take Aaron, and he's going to be the priest. So as con generations continue on, you have more Levites, and you have more Levites who are also from the lineage of Aaron. So you've got the priestly line inside the Levite line. And the Levites work on the, 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 uh, the, the, the temple or the tabernacle, if you, the tent of meeting. And when the Israelites would, and they had no, uh, they were not property holders, although they were given pasture land for, for the cattle because they began to accumulate cattle. But they were not really property holders. So the rest of the tribes, when they tithed, their tithe would go to support the Levites. Okay? And let's go to verses 26 to 29. Moreover, you shall speak to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the sons of Israel the tithe which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you, you Levites, you shall present an offering from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. Your offering should be reckoned to you, okay, and um, he gives the valuation there. Uh, verse 28, so you shall also present an offering to the Lord from your tithes, which you receive from the sons of Aaron, and that from it you shall give the Lord's offering to Aaron the priest. Out of all your gifts, you shall present every offering due to the Lord from all the best of them, the sacred part from them. So the tribes would tithe to Levi, the tribe of Levi, and the Levites would take a tenth of that and they would give it to the priests. And so that was the system that the Lord's, Lord set up in the Old Testament. Okay, um, moving quickly, go to Deuteronomy, which should be the next book in the Old Testament. It is verse chapter 12. And, um, oh yes, okay, verses 5 and 6. Deuteronomy 12, 5 and 6. <clears throat> Deuteronomy also was written while they're at the Mount at Mount Sinai. In fact, Deuteronomy is sort of Moses's swan song. He dies at the end of Deuteronomy. So this is his record summing summing things up. Okay. Deuteronomy 12:5. But you shall seek the Lord at the place which the Lord your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name there for his dwelling and there you shall come. There you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices. Oh, listen to this. Burnt offerings, sacrifices, tithes, the contribution of your hand, your votive offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. <laughs> That's a lot of different things, isn't it? Not just the tithe. And the biggie there is the firstborn of your flock and, and herd. Every heifer that becomes... I forget what you call a cow after they've had a calf. Anyway, the first calf, anything that opens the womb, belongs to the Lord. That's the, the firstborn. And that's in addition, as I understand it, to the tithe. But the, the point I want to make here is, he says, and don't, you don't just do that any old place. You bring it to the place I have designated for my name to dwell. 
And why would he do that? Well, they were moving in, would be moving in, when we leave Deuteronomy and move into Joshua, they would be moving into the promised land to Canaan. The people who lived in Canaan, man, they, they, they sacrificed to their false gods any old place on any high hill that looked good to them. And they had orgies and all kinds of stuff going on. God says, no, 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 no. We're not going to give the, the opportunity for individualized and off, uh, offline forms of worship to arise. We're going to keep this thing uniform under the tutelage of the priests, the way I've explained it here in the Bible. So you don't just do these things any old place you want. You come to the central place. And um, apparently, uh, the, the, pretty quick, that was a place called Shiloh, if you've heard the name Shiloh. Apparently, it was not always at Shiloh. There was a few times it was at Bethel, but primarily at Shiloh. And, and clear up, okay, this is uh, the time of Moses. That would be about 1400 B.C. Cleared it for 400 years to the time of Samuel, who anointed David to be the first king. That's at about 1,000. So for about 400 years, it was at Shiloh. And then, of course, you know that David moved the central place of worship to Jerusalem or to the city of David. So... Um, <clears throat> Just the point I'm making here is God says, bring your tithes to the central place of worship. Okay, now go stay in Deuteronomy, go to chapter 14. Am I moving too fast? I feel like I drank too much coffee today and I'm just going a mile a minute. But you're still with me. Nobody's falling asleep yet. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 through 29. You shall surely tithe all the produce from what you sow, plant, what comes out of the field every year. Every year. So there's the annual. You shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place which he chooses, as I told you, to establish his name. The tithe of your grain, of your new wine, of your oil, and the, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock, so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. If the distance is so great for you that you're not able to bring, you know, bushels and bushels of wheat or whatever to bring the tithe, since the place where the Lord your God chooses to set his name is too far away from you, when the Lord chooses, Lord your God blesses you, then you shall exchange it for money and bind the money in your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. You may spend the money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep or wine, or strong drink, or whatever your heart desires. And there you shall eat in the presence of the Lord, your God, and rejoice, you and your household. Also, you shall not neglect the Levite who is in your town, for he has no portion or inheritance among you. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year, and shall deposit it in your town, or literally in your gates. The Levite, because he has no portion, because Levites didn't only live in the central place. Levites lived throughout. The Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the alien or the immigrant, and the orphan, and the widow who are on, in your town, shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand, which you do. Now we've got one more place to go after this, but to me... This is kind of the main section we need to look about, talking about tithing. <clears throat> We've already seen the central place of worship. We've seen a number of things. But here we see three purposes for tithing as God set up uh, the way his, his people should, should operate. And the first one, we often overlook. It's so that they could have a celebration. I want you to come to this place and we're going to, can I, we're, we're going to party, but not party like the world thinks because it's in the presence of the Lord and we're rejoicing in what God has done, but we're going to celebrate together out of the tithe you have brought. And can you imagine how families would look forward to that? Do families look forward to Christmas in our culture? You bet we do. Or, or Thanksgiving. 
they would think, whoa, this is a time of tithing. We're going to go, and aunts and uncles are going to be there, and our friends are going to be there, and we're going to just, we're going to eat till we can't eat anymore. But it was done, you read it again, in the presence of the Lord, not just, well, here's God, but we're going to go have a weekend bang, you know, deal. No, 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 it's in the presence of the Lord. It was to rejoice in all that God has given them in their, in the, in, in their blessing. And it says in verse um, uh, where is it? Oh, verse 23, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. What do you mean fear him? To reverence him. To realize this party we're having, everything I got back home, this blessing I'm enjoying from God, it came from God, not myself. I fear him. I honor him. I respect him. Whoa, isn't that cool? We're going to have a Thanksgiving feast here in about two, three weeks on the 19th. Yeah, two weeks from today. My prayer is that while we feast together, we're realizing we're doing this as under the Lord, in his presence, thanking him for his blessings and recognizing the reverence and the fear of God as we do this. So that's the first purpose of the tithe. The second purpose is to fund and support the work of the ministry. The Levites, they're the ones who put up the, the tent because the tabernacle was portable. Or in the time of the temple, they're the ones who kept the temple clean and got the, the animals ready for the sacrifice. They're the ones who did the work of the ministry. And then, of course, they tied to the priests, the priests. Now, we don't have Levites today. We don't have priests today. But we have people who are involved in the work of the Lord. And the three of us and our wives were up here this morning. And we need to keep the electric lights on and what have you. So tithing was the Old Testament method of funding the work of the ministry. Thirdly, and, and, and Bible scholars have debates about this. Was there just one tithe or were there two tithes or were there three tithes? <laughs> My opinion is there was one tithe annually, but every third year, that tithe stayed home in the home city. You see, what was that there in verse? Um, <clears throat> well, it's here in this passage. <laughs> um, yes, verse 28. So every third year, if, if I'm understanding it correctly, the tithe stayed in the home city to support the local Levites and to be the social welfare system for that community. Yeah? To, to, to help the immigrant or the orphan or the widow, those who are in need. Now, this was the theocratic nation God set up. There's never been another theocratic nation God set up on the planet in world history, not even the United States. Praise God, we were founded largely on biblical principles and with a reverence for God. Thank God for that, which accounts for much of the blessing we've seen, not our great ingenuity or that we're a better race than anybody else. And we're many races anyway. But, but God set up a theocratic nation so that the work of the ministry would be funded and the work of welfare for those who are genuinely in need. But it wasn't just a handout. Because you know gleaning, where that came from, right? You go through your fields the first time, you get everything you've got, and, but you left some behind, leave it there so that those who have need, they can come through and not just receive a, a government paycheck, uh, but they actually put in some work to, to supplement their income. And I, I mean no dispersion on someone who is, is disabled and can't work. I mean no dispersion there. But this is the system that God set up. Now, is it the system we operate under today? No, because we pay ta taxes, and hopefully some of that money makes it back it through SSI and SSDI and state level, you know, Hopefully that happens. But I still believe this, that the church should, I believe this, that if the church were charged with the social welfare system rather than the government, it would be run a whole lot better. Because government is almost inherently inefficient. 
And we're, okay, but that's where we live, and thank God for every blessing we enjoy. So we encourage people, you know, oh, well, have, you, have you applied for housing assistance if, if they need that help? But I still believe the church should be a place where there can be material financial help given. And in our church, we, <clears throat> we've actually set up policies for how we help those who don't attend our church and those who do. And we have a charitable assistance committee. There are three people on that committee. It's not a secret, but I won't just say it right now. But, um, and and we, we want to help as much as we can. But the way God set it up, those three things, a celebration to the Lord, the funding of the work of the ministry, and the social welfare, welfare system uh, uh, for, for the people. Isn't that cool? Okay, boy. Last passage, are you still with me? I know we're going a long time here. Okay, go to Malachi. As we said, this is Hilda's favorite passage, and it's the last book in the Old Testament. <clears throat> We're headed to chapter 3, verse 8. Let me give you just a little background. Um, a lot of time has gone by since Deuteronomy and Numbers and Moses. And now we're at about, um, well, in, in the 600 B.C.s, Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon took the people of Israel, Jerusalem and Judah captive. And so there you go. Some of them got to start coming back. First thing they did is they rebuilt the temple. Okay, then um, things kind of slowed down and then um, uh, they, they started on the wall around the city, but they didn't finish it. Then you get into the 400 B.C. and Nehemiah comes and he, they complete the wall and I forget what it was, 70 days or 40 days, not, in a short amount of time, complete the wall. And Nehemiah was the appointed governor. He says, listen, it's not just about having a temple and a wall. You guys, we guys, need to get back to obeying God. We need to keep the Sabbath. We need to pay our tithes. We need to not oppress the hired people. We need to give them their wages. You priests, you're corrupt. And you're not to be marrying foreign women. And that's not a racial thing. What he was saying there, don't bring idolatry into your marriage. Because foreign women from, with foreign idol gods. So the people responded to Nehemiah. said, yes, we'll do it. And they did. And then Nehemiah got called back to the capital of Persia because he was, he was a, an official, even though he was a Jew, he was an official in the Persian court. And from the calculations I went through, in, in something in this time span of 26 years, the people of Israel backslid back to all the bad stuff they were doing intermarrying with foreign wives, not keeping the Sabbath, not bringing their tithes in. The priests were corrupt again. And just, it, it was a mess. And that's where Malachi is written. And he says, you guys, you want the Messiah to come? He, he'll come. But he's going to come like a refiner's fire. And he's going to come with judgment. And it ain't going to be pretty, <laughs> basically. And so that brings us to chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, well, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Now, we've seen that before. You bring the tithe into the storehouse, that place where God has said, that's where my name will dwell. And you don't bring part of it, you bring all of it. Why? So that there can be food in my house, so that the ministry will be supported. But look at this. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, every time you turn around, ah, something else broke. Ah, I've got to pay another bill. Ah, it's like the devourer, just choo, just devouring. You've ever had that feeling? I, yeah, we've been there. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so we're wrapping up. 
God again says, bring your whole tithe. It doesn't say I'm going to send out my collectors. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you bring it. You need to be the one doing this. And bring the whole tithe, all of it, all 10%, and bring it into the storehouse. And if you're afraid to do this, God says, test me. Go ahead, test me. Do it. And see if I don't pour out for you a blessing that you can't contain. And bless your land. And I'll rebuke the devourer. And I'll tell him, get lost. Amen. And you'll be a delightful land. You say, well, great, Pastor, I love that. But that's Old Testament. We're New Testament believers. And I would say this. Do you see anywhere in the New Testament that God says, I rescind that promise? Not rescind, rescind. I, I, I negate that promise. I preach and I live tithing, not because it purchases my salvation, and not even because I'm commanded to do it in the New Testament. I practice tithing, I preach tithing because I believe it's a principle that still is valid today and it's a promise that God still honors today. Amen. I just simply believe that. And I would encourage you to test God. Not in the sense of, blah, blah, blah. no, in all honesty. Say, Lord, I, 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 want, I, want you, I want your blessing in my life. Not only financially, just in every way. God, and I, and I want to put you first in my heart, in my life, my finances. Test it. Okay. Oh, man, there's so much more we could say. We will next week, the Lord willing, move to the New Testament, see what the New Testament teaches about financial stewardship and giving. But I think this is foundational. My dad taught me to tithe when I was a youngster. I don't remember, but I think it was connected to his also teaching me entrepreneurship. Remember when I'm the only guy you'll ever meet who sold cucumbers door to door? And he said, grab these cucumbers out of the garden. We'll, we'll weigh them out, put them in bags. I'm going to take you over to uh, Blaine Street Apartments, and you're going to go knock on doors, and you're going to sell cucumbers. I, th I think that's when he took me from Moscow to Troy, 11 miles away, I met Frank Brocky, the, the president of the First Bank, Bank of Troy, opened up a a savings account there, and that's when God, uh, my dad started teaching me to tithe. And, and uh, for the most part, I have, other than the time that I was not living for the Lord, um, I have practiced tithing. Can I tell you this? I would be afraid not to tithe. That's, right. Amen. that's, that's how strongly I feel. God is faithful. I have a loving wife. She believes just the way I do. There was a time when I made some really, really stupid decisions. I won't go into details, but it involved credit cards and day trading on the stock market. Really, really stupid. And uh, I ended up <laughs> in way more debt than I was trying to get out of. But I tithed. We tithed all the way through that. And God kept my nose above water. There was never a month I couldn't pay my bills until... You know, that cycle, because we live in seasons, played itself out, and I, be, I did, away, did away with the, the day trading. Um, and, and, and really, we moved back into a season of God's blessing. So, um, again, there's so much more I could say. I hope, I hope this is helpful. This is not an attempt to get our hand in your pocket. That is not where we're coming from. I share this again because it's a good way to put God first. It is a great plan for uh, supporting the ministry and it opens the doors for God's blessing into our lives. There you have it. Lord God, thank you for the teaching of your word. We pray, Lord, that you would deal with each of us individually. Show us, Lord, what you are leading us to because you do have a unique and individual relationship with each and every one of us. But I pray, God, your financial blessing on your people. I know we have to learn to be content with little or with much. I, I know that. But God, I do pray your blessing. And I thank you. And may your blessing be in this house and not primarily financial or first foremost, but Lord, primarily your presence. 
your presence among us. Thank you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you next week.